ministers. Well, we're joined here in Warsaw at the National Stadium where the UN Climate Change Summit is taking place by Claudia Salerno, the lead climate negotiator for Venezuela here at COP19. She's also Venezuela's vice minister of foreign affairs for North America. Claudia Salerno became famous in 2009 at the Copenhagen Climate Summit COP15 when she banged her hand on the table in an attempt to be heard, hitting it so vigorously it began to bleed. This is what she said. Presidente, ¿a usted le parece... Mr. President, do you think a sovereign country should have to make its hand bleed in order to raise the right to speak because you simply do not want to hear what is happening? This hand which is bleeding wants to speak and it has as much right as any of these which you call representative group of leaders. That was in 2009. In 2011, at COP17 in Durban, South Africa, Claudia Salerno stood up on a chair during a meeting in another attempt to be heard. Here's Claudia Salerno speaking after she was recognized there. Mr. Chair, let me make this clear to the world. I requested the floor way before you gobble and you ignore me. The whole world just witness how much you ignore me. Claudia Salerno, the lead climate negotiator for Venezuela, joins us now here in Warsaw. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's Thank great you. to have you with us. Um, so there you were three years ago, banging your hand till it bled. Uh, then in Durban, South Africa, you're standing on a chair to be recognized. Today, um, I guess as Marcin Karelich was being fired as the environment minister here in Poland, you were the president for the moment of yeah. this COP. Yeah. Yeah, usually as I am a Gulag representative at the bureau, um, bureau members have to take uh, upon the chair when he needs to leave for a certain reason. I had not clue that I was uh, chairing for that specific reason, but yes, I was supposed to be um, at a certain point in the COP taking the, the presidency. Well, for... it's very interesting because yesterday was gender day here at the COP, the Conference of Parties, the UN Climate Summit. Um, what about women's representation here? at these climate talks? In general, uh, women are also are always very strong in their positions. I think uh, Latin America is one of the regions that has the largest women representation at head of their delegations. And also we see some women coming from the African countries. Uh, in general, gender is a quite disregard issue in the formal agenda of the convention. Although when women have a very important role in the mitigation process as such and in the fighting for climate change and also in adaptation. When you mean mitigation, what do you mean? And when you All mean adaptation? That can be done to try to reduce emissions. And uh, as we consider that women are driven, for example, education at the home stages, we consider those are the more important first steps to create a new citizenship and a new kind of human and a new different relationship relationship with those humans with the environment and those are actually women the ones that are responsible to take those first responsibilities towards the future generations the one that we are raising can you talk about what happened early this morning venezuela is part of the group of 77 in china um, they walked out of the climate talks about four o'clock this morning yeah. why Loss and damage, as is known, is an agenda that we never wanted to have in the first place. Uh, I call it this the agenda of resignation, when things are going so wrong that you have to claim only to rich countries to pay for the damages and the losses that they are causing you with their attitudes. That is the most dramatic and pathetic agenda that we have in the table. And although when the situation that, for example, the typhoon recently in Philippines is showing that the situation is dramatical to the point of humanitarian needs, when you see developed countries being so uh, bold to tell you that they are not even considering reducing their emissions, but they are not even considering paying for the cost that those inactions have in the life of others, that is really rude and, and hard to handle it politically, that we are heading to a point in which 
countries are not ready to take responsibility for their acts. And in this case, even more pathetic, they are not uh, wanted to be held responsible for their an action and their lack of responsibility with humanity and uh, future generations. Explain who the 133 countries are, because G77 means group of 77, but 133 countries walked out. It's, it's composed by all developing countries' nations uh, in the, in the um, settings that um, the definitions of economical development that the UN has made. is a group, a very old group, uh, started exactly with 60, 69 that they became growing and growing, and now it is 133 countries plus China. You say this is an economic conference, really, not a climate conference. Why? Because every single action that you need to make to reduce emissions gets actually to, in the land, it gets to the production of something. Uh, economies produce emissions. And uh, when you are talking politically to reduce their emissions, those, emi those reductions are going to touch certain economies, certain kind of productions, certain lines of commercial uh, trading relationships. So that is the kind of agreement that we need to, to make. But there has been a misunderstanding link with that, that actually an economical discussion on how to produce better, how to make things in a better way, to more sustainable way, became actually a, a market opportunity discussion on how to take advantage of the pollution that we are causing. And that is actually the, the wrong interpretation that developed countries have of this process. 95% of your economy, uh, Venezuela, is based on oil exports. How do you diminish that? Actually, Venezuela is known, very known, as an oil producer, but is also a very green country. We were one of the first ones in the region creating a uh, Ministry of Environment and the first one creating a panel law for environment. And we have a large development in the environmental side, uh, signifying for us, for example, the 60% of our territory are protected areas in some kind of form of legality, in untouched areas. And almost the 50% of the territory has been untouched. That that actually make us having a GDP depending highly on the oil economy, but producing emissions that represent currently 0.48% of the total global emissions. And that is quite difficult to set for an oil producer, but we have reached that. Right next to us is the advertisement for next year's COP, COP20, uh, that will take place in Lima, Peru. Uh, if anyone hears noise during the show, it's because they're blending drinks downstairs to give it out to prepare people for the Lima trip. But Venezuela, you're going to hold a pre-COP, what is known as that. Now, Democracy Now!, we've been at the last um, four summits, but also the fifth was the Bolivia People's Summit. Yes. This pre-COP that you're holding in Venezuela, what will it be about? It's not formally recognized as a UN meeting. No, it's not, but it's part of the process, the formal convention process. It's actually an informal meeting, gathering of ministers, about 40 or 50 strong leaders in the process, to try to have a sense in advance of the COP of how is the political readiness to agree on certain things. What Venezuela um, decided when we were elected to host this pre-COP uh, meeting, this ministerial consultation, is that we have been seeing this tendency to make this a business and market um, um, profit uh, convention, uh, sadly taking advantage of the pollution that some are causing. And if we are intended to sign an agreement in 2015, Venezuela said that we just not are going to be able to do it as governments alone. We need to get involved with our, our people and civil society in this process together as one and then to create this alliance. So Venezuela next year will host the first formal social consultation of every single social movement involved in the climate change agenda with three preparation processes in advance of that pre-COP. And then for the first time, instead of having ministers listening to each other's the same statements and stubbornness, we are going to have ministers listen to their people about what is the kind of ambition and the kind of agreement the world wants to have, but the world outside, not the governmental. Democracy uh, Now! got a hold of these confidential documents that came out of Secretary of State John Kerry's 
Foreign Office uh, directing the UN climate change nego negotiators, uh, not to talk about loss and damage, which they fear will become a major issue here at the COP, which it certainly has, but to call it blame and liability. What do you think about that? It is a lot of that since Copenhagen. Once those countries failed to a certain approach, now the whole political game is like to blame others for not doing what they are supposed to do instead of each other's taking their own responsibility for their own acts and act without asking others. And then these uh, other tendency of developed countries that say they are leading, but leading from behind, pushing others to do what they are not ready to do to their own economies. So they are actually expecting developing countries to stop their development to them to be able to continue polluting in the exactly way they are. Let me ask you something that just happened in your country while you're here in uh, Warsaw, Poland at the UN Climate Summit. Um, lawmakers, the Venezuelan Congress has just granted President Maduro uh, the ability to rule by decree for the next year. This has alarmed many inside and outside Venezuela. That means he doesn't need congressional assent. It's not the first time that happened in Venezuela. Venezuela has a long tradition of what it is called habilit habilitative laws uh, to previous presidents. When you have certain circumstances that needs special handling of uh, or um, more rapidity in the in the way in decisions are made, uh, we have the majority in the Congress. So in principle, it would not be a problem for us as politicians to get whatever law we want in the in the Congress because we have the majority. But is a uh, special needs that the particular economical situation we are having that needs actually more speed up um, actions in certain specific rule it's, it's not an open law it's actually driven to stop corruption and uh, to fight strongly Correct. against corruption yes since you were talking about democracy when it comes to the social movements directing the ministers especially if you have the majority in the Congress why he would need these extra powers, even though I understand President Chavez ruled by decree a number of times during his terms. And previous presidents as well, in different uh, moments, since the 50s, I think it was the first uh, habilitative law that came upon. Uh, in principle, he didn't need it, but we need to fight rapidly against that because the situation is quite critical. And the president is ready to go um, and to make justice in whoever is doing the wrong things. So he didn't want it to be in a situation in which, for example, certain, even part of our own process, were going to try to protect themselves in their own roles as a, in different situ political situations. So the president is really, really determined to fight against whoever faults, he said needs to fall. He, he, will, he, will, he will not be flexible. I know you have to leave to meet with the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. He's meeting with leaders of um, countries uh, that, who are here, the head of the climate negotiations, to prepare for the September summit in New York. Um, can you talk about the significance of this? It is quite important. I think 2014 is a year between now and the future agreement that may be um, useful to have this opportunity for presidents to get back to the climate agenda because last time presidents saw each other to talk about this issue was in 2009 who was i think the worst scenario in which presidents were ever in the history of multilateralism that's when you bloodied your hand but why exactly. it what, was what that, was, so it was bad? that bad uh, people were not being given the floor to speak it was that bad it was quite undemocratic it was terrible i mean every single rule was violated in that meeting so I think what he is very courage to do, have the courage to do, is just to reconvene presidents in a different setting, learning from the previous mistakes, admitting that that was a mistake, and then recalling them because the issue is still on the table and we need an agreement. That is a fact. Finally, Claudia Salerno, uh, what is your assessment of the U.S. role here at the climate talks? I am quite surprised to see no role whatsoever. I think that they are, again, expecting things to go wrong, then to be eased by the fact that the agreement is going to be so hard to have that they may get under the table and just let it pass. But I am hoping that the pushing for hope and agreement was going to be stronger than, the, than their 
concerning quiet voice in this meeting because they haven't been talking that much and that's worrying. Claudia Salerno, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Lead climate negotiator for Venezuela here at COP19 in Warsaw, Poland. She's Venezuela's vice minister of foreign affairs for North America and special envoy for climate change. When we